Well, Good Shepherd, we're in week four of our sermon series, Why Me? If you missed any of the other sermons by Pastor Mary or Pastor Meggie, they're available on YouTube and our podcast. I'd encourage you to take a listen because they've been comparing narratives from the Gospels that take us from Why Jesus to Why Me? with a thread that not only teaches us about the historical teachings of Christianity, but how Jesus is still working through humanity today to keep writing the history that's still to come. Now, this isn't something that was simply for a time and place in the past, but features a God that's alive and active today. Same God, just a different supporting cast of disciples. Now, I was reminded of how active God is today by the witness and testimony of 33 young people that recently shared parts of their faith statements with an audience of 450 people, which is not an easy thing to do. I was also reminded of how God has not only worked through their stories, but also in the promises and connections that helped to get them there. The people that have walked alongside them, the church school leaders that helped with exploration and curiosity the small group guides that created space to not only learn about their faith, but also create space for the students to ask deep questions, to be awkward in their tween years, and be a part of a group of other people in this journey. The Lenten mentors who continued to learn alongside the students in faith reminded them that faith formation isn't something that ever ceases. And of course, all of the extended family members that showed up to lay hands in a prayer of blessing on these students for the next chapter in their faith journey because it's not about arriving or graduating or becoming content. Day by day, we seek, we grow, we continue living into that title of God's beloved. Before we can get to a day like Confirmation Sunday, a day where historically Christians affirm their faith and the baptism that started it all, I was reminded of how crucial that baptismal day truly is in planting seeds of faith, not just for the students, but for all of us at any age or stage. Now, why do we talk so much about baptism and confirmation? Because in modern day, baptism is the way that we often come or bring others to encounter Jesus, to experience healing, forgiveness, and new life. And confirmation is that proclaiming in a very public way. Now, I want to preface that we baptize people of all ages, not just babies. So if you haven't been baptized yet, talk to us. We'd love to connect with you about the sacrament. We also create space for deeper faith formation and catechesis to take place in a variety of small groups and Bible studies for our adults, so it's not just reserved for those in the first third of life. I've had some of my friends, though, from non-mainline theological traditions ask, why do we baptize babies? Why not let them just grow to an age where they can decide on their own? And for me, the common answer is because I don't want anyone of any age going through life without God. And that's where we come in. In the promises portion of the baptism service, we remind parents that they are the main influence of all things, including faith formation. But they're not alone. The sponsors that are up there promising to walk alongside the baptized, and the congregation even promises to pray for the baptized in their journey ahead. But why is that? Because the Christian life is about more than just our personal walk with Jesus. And the way that we live out our faith has effects both positive and negative, on the faith of others. This is true. The way that we welcome, the way that we proclaim and pass on faith, the way that we serve, it has an effect on believers and unbelievers alike. And in a world that often focuses intentionally on ourselves, we're invited and called into the scriptures to see the world around us the way that God sees it. And when we do this, God moves mightily. Now, In our preaching text today, the message tells us that One day as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and the religion teachers were sitting around. They'd come from nearly every village in Galilee and Judea, even as far away as Jerusalem to be there. The healing power of God was on him. Now some men arrived carrying a paraplegic man, they say on a stretcher. They were looking for a way to get him into the house and to set him before Jesus. When they couldn't find a way in because of the crowd, they went up to the roof They removed some tiles and they let him down in the middle of everyone, right in front of Jesus. Impressed by their bold belief, Jesus said, Friend, I forgive your sins. That set the religion scholars and Pharisees buzzing. Who does he think he is? That's blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. Now Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking and said, While the gossipy whispering... 
Which is simpler, to say that I forgive your sins or to say, get up and start walking? Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man and authorized to do either or both. He now spoke directly to the paraplegic. He said, get up, take your bedroll and go home. Without a moment's hesitation, he did it. He got up, he took his blanket, and he left for home. And we're told that he gave glory to God all the way. Now the people rubbed their eyes and they were stunned. They also gave glory to God. Awestruck, they said, we've never seen anything like that. And we find ourselves, scripturally speaking, in a tense encounter between Jesus, his followers, curious bystanders, and these religious gatekeepers of the time. Now, the common people in Nazareth, they're now turning to Jesus to be made well, to be made whole. But the religious people are turning on Jesus with charges of blasphemy. Who is this man and how dare he say and do these things? But Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, is now progressing in his ministry to provide healing to those that seek. Now, an interesting note in Luke's account of this story as compared to Matthew and Mark is that he points out who the people are in the crowd namely Pharisees and other religious leaders, where the visual in the other stories is a crowd gathering to consume the teaching of Jesus. The crowd gathered is actually there to refute the teaching of Jesus. Another notable difference is in Luke. It says this, the other accounts say that he was brought there by four friends. In this account, we're told that some friends took him in and carried him on a stretcher or his bed which at first glance doesn't really make a huge difference to me in how I interpret this account. But as I've sat with it for the past week, I see these two differences as major. Not because of the scriptural differences themselves, but how they can look after the fact from 10,000 feet. To me, the visual of someone being delivered on a stretcher screams urgency and emergency. Though the visual of four people carrying someone could also provide that. But if we see an ambulance on the highway... We move over, out of the way, out of courtesy and obedience. But as we've heard, they moved urgently, and when they arrived, there was no room at the inn. In the other gospel accounts, one could assume this was because there were too many other people trying to receive blessing or healing from Jesus. But in Luke, we learn that besides those that had heard via word of mouth, it's actually just a large number of people getting in the way, physically blocking the man and his friends. Now, in Matthew and Mark, Everyone everyone wants to fully encounter what Jesus is there to do. In Luke, the majority are actually religious people from near and far wanting to discredit what's taking place, blocking access to someone in need in the process. But the mass gathering of doubters and critics doesn't stop the men and his friends from getting in. In fact, we're told that they take him to the roof, they lower him in. Jesus looks up, he sees their faith, and tells the man that his sins are forgiven. The man's actually forgiven and healed because of the faith of his friends. So why me? Because not everybody can come to Jesus on their own. And Jesus can use us to help people get the healing and faith that they need. Like one of my favorite beer and hymn sing-along songs states boldly, sometimes in our lives, we all have pain. We all have sorrow. But if we are wise... We know that there is always tomorrow. So lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. For it won't be long till I'm going to need somebody to lean on. In our preaching text, there was a friend in need. One can assume that pain and sorrow was certainly present for the paralyzed man, whether mental or physical. And the friends knew that to get to tomorrow and have it be different than today, something needed to change. So they invited him to lean on them and allow them to carry him to Jesus. Now, I'm sure the people had other things that they could have filled their time with, but they chose to do something for someone else. And as I pondered the title of our sermon today, Why Me? Because it's not about me. We're called to remove the blinders and see the world around us. And in that very moment, we can choose to be the crowd that's blocking people from encountering Jesus Or we can choose to be the friends that will do anything to help somebody encounter Jesus. From the newly baptized and those affirming their faith, to the person in need of forgiveness and healing, to the person hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, while claiming their baptism. We all need Jesus, and we all need to experience his love fully. 
And we need to make sure that others experience it fully too. That's the mission of our church. That's the mission that Jesus has for us. Not to simply be scholars, but followers of the way. Part of the beauty that is the Christian life is that we're not called to do it alone. Imperfect as we may be at times, individually or even as the church, God's grace meets us where we are. And when we turn to Jesus in need of healing and forgiveness or new life, Jesus tells us that our sins are forgiven. And that can be controversial for some, but it's life-changing for all. Why me? Because it's not about me. But that doesn't become an out. Instead, God uses you, me, everybody, to be a light in this world, shining grace and hope, peace and love, healing and forgiveness, so that all may know. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, we're so grateful for the gift of healing and forgiveness and new life that you offer. And God, I pray that as a church and as individuals, we'd find ways to make sure that everybody can experience that fully. God, we're grateful for that gift of grace. We're grateful for that gift of healing. May it be so for us and for all. Amen.